speak that well. Um, a little bit of um, I've got them in plants and then 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 I've got them in and most recently in Massachusetts and have been worked with some Dutch partners down here. Um, and we currently work with the Wasu, which stands for Worker Development Supply Company. Uh, started about 70 years ago in a rolling shop that just here, which is in the way of Um, and it's been expanded to all sorts of small scale agriculture, medium scale food processing, with some commercial agriculture. Uh, tools, equipment, and so it's a really spread out company. Um, yeah, it's a little bit about me and what I do. Um, like to sort of also a story. Does anybody know what this is? It's like a huge chisel. Yeah. It's a problem bomber and a bomber. So it's used to to move rocks and when you're digging, if there's something really stuck, you get in there and lever it out. Um, this was found about 30 years ago by my father in Duncan, Massachusetts, leaning up against a rock in a quarry. So someone had left it there and he was lucky enough to find it, bring it home. And uh, growing up as a young boy, I used to use it to pry rocks and, you know, break up stubborn patches of earth. And, I'm just kind of always amazed at seeing, you know, this grown human using these powerful tools um, to work with the earth. And when we passed a couple of years ago, I inherited it and I was using it the other day to pry rocks and move earth around to build a fence. And when I was holding it in my hands, I came up with the, uh, the main kind of tools. It's I have a connection with this humble resting piece of iron that I don't think I could. Uh, you know, purchase or replicate. Um, so this was the inspiration to find their own tools. And then starting there with move them slide. So why are we talking about tools? I think um as humans it's a fundamental nature to use tools, it's a very big part of what makes us human. Um and and yeah, so they're very important to what we do, especially in agriculture. And I think that we have two things in language, so you can kind of do whatever we want to do. And I really hope that we we would do good things because we have the potential to do wonderful and terrible things with that power. And so I personally would like to live in one where regenerative agriculture or producing anything products and making the earth a more habitable place. Um, and currently, I think as we all know, we live in a bit of a, uh, a disposable culture. So heirloom tools, I think, are one of the tools that we can use to resist that habit. Um, and a big part of that habit is planned obsolescence. So you probably already know, but planned, planned obsolescence is to create something so that it will eventually break. Um, so you can buy another one and people can see more things. Uh, I think of Apple Store, this is a really good example that we all know of when they were, you know, putting all the software into the phones to make them become obsolete faster. Uh, it's a really cheap idea, which I would not like to be part of. So, how many tools um, I'm going to last a lifetime. Hopefully, you know, I've got a total of one of these materials. Um, so, the metal and all these things in the we have a lot of embodied energy. That's probably a concept you're all aware of. The amount of different energy and resources it takes to wrestle this metal out of the ground is pretty huge. 
have to take iron ore, you know, mine that from a mountain to smelt a place to do that and smelt it down, bring it to a foundry and forge it. And if I don't know if you've ever seen a foundry or a metal uh, workshop, but there's a lot of oil, there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of dirt, there's a lot of um, embodied energy. So within each of these things, there's a certain amount of embodied energy and human footprint that I have to consider when I think about them. And, you know, I'm throwing something away. Uh, it, it kind of pains me to think about all of the energy that it took to make that thing. Um, so by choosing tools that can have a legacy, uh, we, we will reduce the footprint overall, especially if we can hand these down or repair these tools. I think it's a, a huge change that we can make to respect what we do have. Um, yeah. So another important thing that everyone, I think, thinks about from time to time, whether we like it or not, is uh, you can also save any money by, uh, I like to say, buy one scrap once. So if you buy a really expensive tool, um, potentially last many lifetimes, you can divide the cost of that tool by the use. And, you know, you might be buying a hundred dollar tool, but if you use it a thousand times, it's, you know, cents for use, which is something that uh, um, also reflects all these other concepts I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so so these two these two quotes from Tom Fung, the richest man is not he who has the most, but he who needs the least. I've been really contemplating that a lot. Um, I think it's been quoted by a lot of people. I think it's an Arab, Arab program. I think like it's more of an older uh, mindset. And then nowadays, this is from you know, the Golden Forbes. So he who dies with the most twice wins. Um, I think that is more of a modern mindset, which I don't really want to be part of. So that's why I'm talking about tools today. Um, so there's a lot of stories that we have as we do see the avenues of where we can get things. Um, you can go on Amazon.com and have it delivered to your door free and choose between an infinite amount of things. Or, you know, you can put the money into a, like there's a Holton Tools um, over at the, over there, there's a local gentleman who can stand behind what he has. And he has some beautiful stuff over there, but I really couldn't help but stand and talk to them for a long time. But so yeah, we have a new choice. Um, let me go to the slide here. So, one thing I'd like to talk about is how context influences engineering. It's kind of a huge topic that I've been fleshing out and noticing in my travels. Um, I was over at a conference um, in Turpoma in Lima and Italy recently and seeing, you know, how they make their tools and how Europe tools, European tools differ greatly from American tools within history. And there's a couple different reasons why I can think that's probably much more um, why this happens. One of them is, you know, they've been, you know, on that land for centuries. So they've been using those resources. They've been making metal tools. They've been using the forest for so long that a lot of the resources have gone. I was literally noticing people were uh, planting poplar trees in a plantation for pots. And that concept is so foreign to us, actually, like trying to clean pretending that kind of human resistance of forests. Um, so they seem to be much more, they have to do more with less. Um, one of those reasons is that energy costs in Europe, it's been the equivalent of $8 a gallon for gasoline. Energy prices are very hot. They have to be rooted with these resources. Um, and because of them, I think we have a sort of mess in the tools that we don't quite see in our tools. 
Um, in America, we or on this continent, Turtle Island, we still have a lot of resources, which I think is very important to uh, protect them. But it shouldn't be like seen over our tools like this uh, shovel is made in America. And as you can see, it's just one huge piece of metal. Uh, so because we have all these resources, we can use them or do use them, good matter or worse. Um, and this makes an incredibly strong, sturdy tool. Um, it also ends up being a little bulky and heavy, in my opinion. Whereas this Japanese shovel, um, they're using the bare minimum amount of metal because they have to either import their metal or, or reuse it from previous sources. And they've really finessed the blade to be just what it needs to be without being anything more. So I think that's a good sort of representation of, of resource limitation. Um, another interesting concept which I was thinking about for how context influences engineering is um, in ergonomics and safety. So in Europe, and I'm just trying to bash on America, by the way, but I just, this is what I'm gonna say. Um, in Europe, they have social um, healthcare. So they all have to come together to take care of each other. So it's in their best interest that everyone stays healthy because then if you're not healthy, I'm um, just pay for you and we become, you know, those are good men's society. Here in America, obviously, we have individualized health care. So if you hurt yourself, as long as you don't sue me, it's not my problem. It's kind of the fault. I don't know, but maybe that's a mean way of putting it. But um, we're going this. In the tool that's still in South America, we like extremely powerful, extremely effective, and pretty darn dangerous tools. Um, and we really like that. Once we we get the general done, you know, man spans tool. Um, and as long as you put a safety sticker on it, then the, the manufacturer is pretty safe from getting in trouble. Where in Europe, they have, um, they seem to be making tools that are much more ergonomic and safe to reduce injury. Um, sometimes so safe that American people don't even want them because it's like, I don't want to use both my hands and this, you know, like, you know have a hand free and. Um, I'm going to tell you about what that kind of looks like in these two game tools. So this is like a felt wood tool, which is very popular, most people know about this one. Um, and it is made in Swiss, Switzerland, it's a Swiss made tool. Uh, but this is the American Kinefoot. Uh, it's a bypass pruner, which means the blades cross each other when they cut. Um, beautiful tool. And this here is a Anvil printer made in Germany. Hello, I think I'm saying that right. It means lion in German. Um, and it's an anvil stone pruning, which you can feel the difference on some of you, but it, uh, in my opinion, is much more ergonomic, much more gentle on your tendons and ligaments. Um, just so much less pressure is needed to make the cut. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons it's favored there. In America, we have this uh, fountain that. And we'll print which wood when we use them. That's why a lot of fruit tree grower, you know, uh, orchardists and landscapers try not to use them. But if you have a quality made tool, um, you'll see there's a little bit of difference. So I don't know if you got anything else to do or what to do this for. Here's the F2. is uh, so it's not an easy other to the other. It's the rolling, is it? Okay, Yeah. My son is the other 
um but you can see just from the ends of these screws in here, um, all parts of this will be replaceable. So if you need to play Simpson, you need to ruin your blade, you can switch that out and actually repeat this tool. Um, I've seen I've talked to many people in Berlin and said, I'm gonna find my compounds for 30 years, I need a new blade. And I think that's a really beautiful thing um, because they have a connection with them. And there's a story behind them, you know, they can run in their arms in the virtual the garden or whatever they're doing. With it. Um, so anyway, is it maybe it's derivative um then really for most 99% of people, this is gonna be a once it breaks, replace the cliff tool. So I think it's going to last, but it's much less likely that you will have this. For decades, we were possibly handed on to your, you know, children or grandchildren or whoever is important to you. Um, so, being a criminal is pretty easy to see. Well, um, yeah, it's process you so can see the difference. Any reason for seeing to buy one that's not repairable? Like, is there any drawback? Or is it like pretty much always you want to buy a repairable tool? So, so the the fifteen thing is like the about seventy five and seventy milligrams right now, so pretty expensive tool. The other one is around thirty five dollars. So I would argue, if you were to buy a bunch of tools for your crew, um, that you may never see again, make it lost, make it beat up because it just kind of happens when people don't own the tools, they end up abusing them a little bit. Um. Then maybe that's why you would for economic reasons. Okay. Good question, good answer there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's see. How do you find place on parts? So Funko has been around for a long, long time. And you know, it's reasonable to assume, yeah, they've been making tools since 1945. They actually really came um but during World War II, they, they actually were making uh, wire clipping tools. So during World War II, uh, after all this, they became key in supplying hand tools to people who were cleaning up after World War II. So it's really where they got the, uh, where they're, you know, um, stuff. So they've been for a long time. The reason to stand to make good tools, people like them, they still will be around for a while. So I imagine you will be able to find parts for those in 10 to 50 years. Um, but especially with modernized things like that, um, you really want to make sure it's something that you can find the parts for, because I've talked to many people who have this amazing machine from this company, and then you know they, they go one room, you just can't get the tools for smooth the atmosphere or something. So it becomes a real problem. Um, and I mean, I don't know what's going to happen to you, let alone 50 years, but you can kind of, you know, get a sense of a company on um, that way. And supply chains, um, this obviously uh, came to the forefront of my mind during the pandemic, um, because we had critical supplies for orchards that, you know, normally are always there, you can get them in a day or two. And we were sometimes 52 weeks out or more um, and being able to get some of these things. And, you know, the apples aren't going to wait for anybody. So it becomes a real problem. And I think sourcing from domestic, you know, like things made in our country will help 
hopefully uh, mitigate some of the vulnerabilities we have from global supply chains, but it's a tricky one. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely something to consider when you're choosing a tool. Next uh, would be the quality of construction. So um, this is a great example. What would you do? You know, you know what these are? Blueberries. Lowbush blueberries. Lowbush blueberry ribs. So this one is obviously uh, maybe of a slightly, it's not just quality. It was a purchase kind of on a whim, needed a blueberry rig, bought this one, a um, little ashamed about it. But you can still have to see that this might not last my entire lifetime or um, we'll see. I'll try to be gentle on it. Uh, this is made by a covered ring company in Maine, and it's uh, welded aluminum with stainless steel tines. And boy, unless I ran this over with my vehicle, I don't see why this um, wouldn't last forever. So I don't know if you want to. But we've done some of it. I'm something built this one with aluminum. This we built it. Um, this is very heavy, which didn't be laborious after a while. But that's really funny. Yeah. So that definitely adds up over the course of the day. So I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, learning, there's a lot of things into it, but with quality of construction, learning about all the metals is a whole study in and of its. So there's stick metal, which is when they just press it and break to make you know a quick. I don't think I have any stick metal things here. Just yeah, so there's stamps, and then you can forge, which is used to pour liquid metal into a box. And that ends up being really strong and it's very, um, very desirable. And welded is can or cannot be desirable depending on who did the weld, because there's a lot of differences in fusing metal together. But in a quick glance, you can see um, if it's tight, if there's long holes, if there's going to be spaces for water to get and the rest to start. So if you just take a moment um, and examine a tool, I think the easiest way to gauge quality of construction without getting into all the nitty gritties of metal and genius and, uh, and woodworking techniques and all that is you just feel it in your hands. Your, your hands know um, if that tool A is going to be suited for you and B is, is it going to last. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to sit. What is this? Is this flow going to be? Oh, no. It is the yeah, it looks like it. I don't think it's not the worst one I've ever seen. Yeah, the other one, the plastic one. Wow. Well, yeah. Which which one? Where? I don't know. Which one? Oh, yeah. I just see something that would be interesting. What was the quality of the windows? The windows were the one top. Quality well job. Well, I'm doing this. I'm saying that there's no response for there to be a weakness to say yet. I mean, this is, you're not doing heavy duty work. You're picking blueberries for this. So, so this is probably, I mean, this is never going to go anywhere. Let's see. It's funny, though. It is funny, maybe. It's the thing with all these little tools. This store I, I bought and I lost a bolt on immediately, so I went to kind of weld it. Um, so I lost the bolt right here. So I just had this little cap weld put on. And even this, you know, what is that? Three quarters of an inch worth of weld is enough where I don't think I'll ever break that. I mean, I could try, but I don't think I will. So I'm going to weld things a long way, but. Um, I'm sure you think of the implements too. Um, they're undergoing a lot more stress than the blind tool would. You know, if you're dragging around with the tool, there's a lot more to consider there with uh, the quality of the instruction and the bigger implements. 
Um, a quick thing on a quick talk on metal. So, you're from the steel, just if it's a high carbon fountain in the metal, it's going to be much easier to put an edge on and to take an edge and to hold an edge. Um, but it also rusts very easily. Stainless steel um, stains less. So it's not perfect, but it's good food quality metal and um, and it can withstand a little bit more abuse as far as you leaving it in the rain and things like that. Um, a little hard to something and in my opinion, just hold up edges easily. <laughs> Aluminum can be extremely nice. Um, a little metal, but very lightweight, especially if you're thinking about uh, like pole saws or something like that. If you're putting that piece of metal at the top of the pole, you want it to be light. Um, so it's a good, good uh, thing to use in certain applications. Like this tool here is aircraft grade aluminum. Um, so it's sturdy and tight. So, yeah. So we go to the next slide. Oh, so for you really pretty. What I was talking about with Hannah before was, you know, if you're flying pool for the crew, you have to consider that they're going to be maybe not treated the same way you might treat a tool. So it's pretty obvious. But, uh, so in that instance, I could see buying, you know, a, a less expensive tool if you're using something like that. And if you were if you had a landscaping company and you're giving young ambitious people tools, they might shy away from wood and handles because young, young, strong people will break things just because they can. And um, these metal WWM tools are actually awesome for landscapers because they can take a lot of abuse. Um, so I guess it depends on what your application is, but sometimes it makes sense to buy the really nice tools for a crew. Um, and then the little ones that put in pockets and you lose to build on the things like me, uh, it's probably better to go a little less expensive on that realistically. Um, and then next slide. So this is a huge part of building tools. Um, I wouldn't have this if Satan and Lucy magically left it laying on a boulder with a piece of chest in the Bentley quarry. But uh, it's not going to be an heirloom tool. It's my heirloom tool. So, number one thing is actually a huge thing. Um, and I was a chef for, for five years. So, mise en place is something that's often talked about in kitchens, which um, probably butchering is translation, but it's pretty much everything has its place. It should have its place. So, I'm personally a very disorganized person, and this is the most organized thing I own in my image. This is true. So this is like a this is my bag of tools for tools. And you look at them. I'm with every single tool, and like, this always goes here. Um, so this is, I think, a really important technique to keep the things in your possession. Um, yes, especially when you have a crew, because you know, you're spending, you don't want to spend a lot of money paying people to look for things. That's a big waste of time. Um, Blair piece is also extremely useful. I mean by that is making something really stand out so you can find it. Um, this is one of my favorite tools, and I have one at home. I didn't bring it, but a uh, new one. But I bought it, and I almost immediately lost it in winter and putting in the winter. Put this down once, hang it up on a tree. Where'd it go? I don't know. So I ended up taking neon spray paint and covering the whole thing. I know it looks so beautiful, and I just covered it in neon spray paint. But then I still have it, so that's the thing. Um, I've seen people use colorful tape. You know, wrap a couple of pieces of tape around there, a big bright ribbon, something to make it stand out from the ground. Um, I love tools that have bright orange colors. I mean, they're not natural and aesthetically pleasing like we might like, but at least you can find them and they have a chance of 
of not being lost. So I think flare faces are very important. Um, let's see, Ooh, holsters. This is another tool for your tools. Um, this F910 is my favorite holster because it fits my lows very nicely. Um, doesn't fall out. So, and it also comes on relatively easily. Has the bell option if you really want to get ready for the day with so your belt. It also has the spring point where I have written my name on it, which I have also written my name on every one of those tools in that bag. Um, so yeah, this is just, it uh, reminds me, like, oh yeah, I have a tool. You go to put bag in there. No, it just, it's, it's another mental uh, thing that I use that actually really it. Otherwise, you just put them somewhere weird, and they're gone, and then there's someone else's tool. Um, Okay, so yeah, that's holsters. Accountability and systems for the crew. Um, I don't know if what your, all of your experience is with this, but I always ask how people do this because, you know, especially if you have a large farm. I worked at Red Farm for a little bit, they had 80 employees, and they're all putting their tools back and without some sort of system, it's crazy very fast. Um, and also a lot of farms at the beginning of the season will, will hand people out tools that uh, you, you have this little pruners, you carry them for the year, hopefully you give it back to me at the end of the year. Um, and then what sort of systems and accountability can we have that are not too heavy um, to try to get them full back so we can keep using them, we have to buy more so we can have more embodied energy and fat and all that stuff we're trying to avoid. Um, so I don't know if you guys have any ideas, but I'd love to hear what you do. I favor science, all the science, um, shovels, rakes, you know, it's a uh, pretty, pretty good thing to have. It's a little bit of time, it's a little bit of time, that's, that's pretty obvious to stop talking about it. Um, lending and borrowing tools. I, I told myself yesterday though, wouldn't get too emotionally charged about to look at this. Uh, lending tools, I think you should practice non attachment with my knee tool. And then, what are tools? Uh, what do you do when it breaks? What do you do when you borrow a tool and it breaks? Then, you know, um, I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, next slide. Mm -hmm. All right. So from hand tools, uh, we have respect. So bring your tools back to their home, whether they're going to be a holster, whether they're going to be a bag, whether they're going to be a uh, spot under signs in a barn. Um, I think I know I have been guilty in my life of just, you know, you work in and you leave there and I go up here and here, you know. So, um, just having that, that connection to a tool, I think buying an expensive tool kind of helps. It's like, no, oh, I really don't want to lose this $20 tool, but you know, it's like you have some, something in it. Um, yeah, it would be really satisfying. Left it in some rocks, don't you know? Um, so yeah, that's some of the things that you can do. Um, probably the only organized thing in my life for the most part. Um, secondly, water, dirt, and acids are going to deteriorate tools. Um, you can tell this one's obviously not very clean, and it probably should have spoken more in the regard, but it will take, I don't know, maybe two centuries for this amount of metal to turn into rust. So I guess we can afford that laziness with this specific tool, but moving, you know, um, what was wet when you put them away? or leaving the dirt on them um, is gonna just deteriorate the lifetime or, or limit and lessen the lifetime of your tool. So um, all tools have limitations and boundaries and specific uses. You know, you have a wooden handled shovel, you shouldn't pry that rock with it. You shouldn't grab the the uh, front of you know, because this obviously if you're the limit group student from the limit of this at one point. You know, I shouldn't probably bend it back, but I would get 
So it's almost really two big elements. Um, if you could just avoid sticking these in the dirt, that would be really wise. Um, I know a lot of people come in with their saws and they're like, oh, that one room going in the way and I can't think it after it and you need a replaceable blade. And I mean, when you can't have a billion tools, you shouldn't put them up, you should. But um, a root saw would be a perfect thing to use in that instance or use your crumb bar to smash the root instead of putting your beautiful piece of steel in the dirt. Um, so I think that's something we all have to do. Um, with these tools, I can and I go over it a lot. You can like slip a little bit and then put a little branch and then slip again. So you can get to really thinking capacity. But if you get to a certain point, this thin blade wants to talk over, then it gets stuck. And then I don't know if we've all experienced that, but they could bypass when there's something too big in there in the blades. And you're really putting a lot of stress on the internal mechanisms and just it's disrespectful to the tool and disrespectful to the ability to energy and all you know how lucky we are to be able to even find these things um so get off the sort of on that one metal likes oil so like metal um obviously water and dirty acids make it rust and if you oil your metal they, or um butcher's wax is another really good thing to use to kind of like small blades and stuff like that. It could be a nice protective coating and prevent rust, which is the enemy of metal. Um, sand bucket is really nice. You can have like things like that, big sand bucket. You can kind of run it through there a little bit and get off some of that drum. Um, that's kind of a quick one, a nice one to have. Also, like uh, near my winding hose, if you can put a brush. We have a station, you know, especially if you have a crew or something like that, to just quickly wipe off the tools. Uh, if you're feeling really good, you can oil them too and put them away nice and nice. Most of that stuff for me actually happens in the winter if I, you know, I'm on it. You know, I have to admit, I don't, you know, not perfect every time, but I'm going to be better with my things. So I don't have to buy more and I can find them back on you. Um, yeah. I'm thinking I am. This is a great resource. Turbine is its own thing. Um, but I think that uh, DMT Sharp website is going to get you really to um, some really good videos and instructional things being you want to share the tools. That's something that interests you. Um, yeah. Tools or tools. So we have a couple different tools that I like to. I have a one knife is like a two handed knife. You probably know to take bark off of um, wood, but it wants to be really helpful if uh, you're putting in a new handle and you need to paper down a little of that handle to flip into this, this piece of metal so you can use the draw more to rid it on it to stick the wood or stand on it. I think that's a nice one to have. Seat clamps or um, those little mechanized. Clamps are really good if you get a split in your handle and you don't want to replace the whole thing. You can put one on there and tighten it up. Um, we can really get some more use out of that handle. Uh, device is just nice to have for all working on tools. The device is like um, a clamp of being metal clamp. It's really fitting in the handle and you can close it and hold on things so you can break place. Grinding hill is great for sharpening, cleaning, buffing up tools, all that good stuff. WD-40. There's my first question of the day. What does WD-40 stand for? Water oh, density. Something like that, water displacement, water density. Yes. Uh, what happened? Water. Nope. <laughs> WD-40 stands for Water Displacement uh, Formula Number 40. So, so uh, WD-40 is great if you have a seized up bullets. Water Displacement Formula Number 40. Wow. Yeah. So, same. Um, These kind of materials are waiting at 
It's not a lubricant. It does not lubricate metal. It displaces water. It's if something is seized up and you need to break it apart. You can put some WD-40 on there, but if you're putting you know, too much of it on a chain or something, it's actually going to drop it out and make it more likely to break. So um, WD-40, you can just, a lot of people use it and they just want to stress that point because you know, it has its uses, but also has drawbacks. I don't know. A little while, maybe. Oh, this one is quiet. Oh, bye bye. Okay. What's the name of anyone in Christian games? This one's still dreaming to Steve. Is that right? 15. Mm -hmm. One half hour. Okay, so if you want to do, we can play a game, which, um, does anyone know what this is? You're back. Oh, okay. back. Okay. I'm tired. Yeah, it's 3 days. So it's 2 40 Can you get a chance? Can you go to the side? <laughs> No, no, no. on this day. Oh, okay, so I'm going to put most of the hand tools. We have both of the hand tools because that's what I love. We have a most of Most of the a lot of power tools. It's like, um, then I think the habit place, sometimes you can use things to make an omelet, so sometimes you need things to do. Uh, if you can get glass power tools, I recommend. Choosing reputable engine with lots of points available where you think you'll be able to get parts for a long time. Uh, in America, currently, Honda and Polar engines seem to be the easiest for this, and people really know how to work on them. So, I have great take towards those types of engines in your equipment. Um, use the best fuel you can afford. Like, the fuel, it's usually small engines, things like chainsaws, we want to force. Two stroke engines, um, they do not do well with ethanol. So you can either go get non ethanol gas from the engine or um, uh, the air horn. Sometimes it's small, but there's some non ethanol gas. I have to get those to get it. You can get pre mixed stabilized gas, um, which it'll just extend the life of your power tool and give you less trouble with your students all the time. So it actually does make sense to use more expensive fuel. Um, maintenance is less expensive than you can. You know, sometimes it seems daunting. Put some early engines and seems like a three of little things you could do, like placing spark plugs or fuel for those, or um, you know, using the tool appropriately. Then it's also going to give you a lot more life time because you know these these things have a lot of body energy and. They're doing it nasty, so um, they take care of it. Do not store with gas for winter. This is this is huge. Um, gas is very caustic, nasty stuff. Um, and it's going to eat away at all the rubber gaskets, all of the tubes, and the inside of your engine is going to grow a lot faster. Sitting there with like gas in it, so you don't want to run it dry. You know, try to use it up or just. Or, you know, use it in some way, get it out of the engine for the winter storage. That's a thing. Um, and a little easy goes a long way. Uh, if your engine's really not starting, it's a little too much to be 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 It'll give it an inch of length and it can be enough to get the engine a little over and you'll look like a total wizard. It's awesome. A little bit of heat that can really help you uh, get power tools started again. Don't want to overdo it, it's very combustible. Um, so, yeah. Uh, electric tools. My personal opinion is um, 
this is a transitional technology, which I think is becoming more and more viable. I see someone up on a bucket truck with an electric chainsaw. Yeah, the new ones, obviously. It's just whenever you touch it, so you can use power, it's not always going. Um, so they're definitely using these breakfast models becoming very uh, viable options. Um, but they do have downsides too. Um, they're, they're very clean, obviously, no last, no fuss, no nasty stuff to work with. Very little noise compared to a, a, a massive event. Uh, no bubbles, you don't have to mix with all that stuff. For the usual, um, but how are we getting the power? You know, where is that power actually coming from? Is it a more sustainable source of energy? Um, so we have a long ways to go before we can transition there. But I think if we don't start using these things, we'll never get there. So there's going to be like growing pains, like putting in more infrastructure to move electricity around, different ways to make clean electricity. And, uh, you know, that's a whole other topic that I don't need to get into. Um, they do seem less likely to be repaired. Because they're often made not as sturdy in my experience. Like the chainsaws, they're, they're, I feel like I'm going to break it when I hold it. Um, not that they're not extremely dangerous to problem hold, they just feel like they're easy to break. Um, but I'm excited about it. I mean, you know, mostly with like a lot of electric tools, it's just so nice. It always starts. You don't have to think about ether and all this nasty stuff. Um, and I would say choose a brand and stick with it. I've seen this because, you know, if you buy this one Ryobi power tool and then you buy this Makita power tool and then you have a DeWalt little battery for each one, if you find a brand that's pretty good for you and then you can have, you know, two batteries at all times, swapping between all the tools, that's a really nice thing. So you do a little research, find your, find your brand, like kind of stick with it. Uh, I like rigid just because I don't know my dad liked rigid and I bought into it. That's kind of what I use most of the time for my little electric tools. Um, but yeah, I, I have maybe some growing pains into making sure that that's uh, actually a sustainable option. But like solar panels, if we don't see them doing it now, it'll never get there. It won't for, for bad habits. Um, maybe to the next slide, please. So, in all, uh, the correct tool for the time makes all the difference. And yeah, if you'd like to do a little and tell and talk about some of these tools here, if you don't mind. Um, anybody know what this one is? It has to do with animals. It's not picking up. Sort of close. Like breaking the one of the drop. Uh, I don't know. It's a little bit of a bygone era because in the 1980s, um, this, this young girl from Oregon became very sick and passed away due to drinking cider, um, sweet cider made from windfall apples. And windfall apples for millennia has been. All humans collect the apples because they're fully drunk when they fall from the wind. Um, when we collect them, and if you ferment them with a cider, it ensures that it's always safe and it's not like it's not going to be biologically dangerous. But it's just opposite of the water. Um, but yet, yeah, so we pick the apples and make sweet cider. If you think about it, sweet cider is just nutrient dense, it's sweet, it's the perfect breeding ground for bacteria. So if you find some apples or apples with like a little animal, um, you know, stuff on them, then that could be dangerous. So after you use the you have been the uh, West Coast Barn and took away this bell corn. Sometime, I think in the 70s, they brought in a ton of these and they're very popular because there's a lot of fallen apples in orchards. People need to clean it up. Um, and it's just kind of cool because you can rake through grass, you know, you can grab onto things, but it does pull the apples. Um, so I think that's a unique tool from a bygone era. Um, 
Commercial lab, there's no commercial application to this, is what I'm saying. Yeah. And, yeah. I'm curious if you found any other tools that have died without commercial application that you really like. Maybe that's a topic for another session. Um, does anybody know what this is? Let's see if I get this off. No idea. Oh, is that a. This makes There it is. There it is. What's this from the solution? It's just a very cool tool, right? Yeah, yeah. Looks like we hang it from a tree as the left side. You know, I might end up cutting. Let me scream something. Scraper. It kind of actually has an absolute use. This is a shop. This is the sound of the Andes in the view. What do you say? The products. Yeah, they're not some moments. How you can get it? Please, maybe. So this one man had a UMass Fall Street bar and a bend in the corner of a bar and a dusty garden place. Uh, it's a cleft grafting tool. So if you're taking old trees and you're reworking them to put a new sign in the wood, you make a big plank, and then you just take that tool and use a mallet to make a split in the tree. And then you take that hook, not the, not the hook, but the pry, and you pry it open, you sneak your smile on wood in there, and then you can turn it with a little of wax on it. It's a sweet, we need these for us. So they end up being really expensive because they're animated by a blacksmith. States that you know it's expensive to do that. That is what I'm your little specialty work. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of my favorites. Um, this one? Sockets, something like that. You made your clips. Apples. Apples. It's apple sizing. Cuts. Uh, so send you grow because there's like a uh, you know, especially if you're growing for every town market, there are also a lot of standards for fruit. So they use this to make sure you get the really fancy grade and then, you know, what's the quality apples, but it's aluminum. Um, that one will be passed down for a long time, as long as you don't have stick. Um, so that's the one. Let's just change the size of the And let's see. It's good. Oh, it's logging. Uh huh. Yeah. But are these specific logging activities? Probably when you're using horses or like, you know, logging without a skid steer, you need to be able to have a skid steer and I'll flip the log over. Yes. So this is um, this is my tiny American tool. This is a key beef. Uh, and it was just developed in a company in Maine. Um, and it's for when we used to transport logs via rivers. So this point here was actually used to break up log jams. 
Um, they don't make them much longer. I bought this one. It's kind of easy to plug them out. Um, and then, like you said, when you want to move a log, you jam this into the log, and then you can actually get a lever to turn whole piece of timber. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is for logging. They make another one. Um, the PB is the one with the point, and it's kind of no longer that useful because we're not often running logs down rivers anymore. But there's another one with a point. Um, like can't. So that means using mills specifically, because when you take the log and you cut four edges each, the more you mill out there on each board, it's called the cant. So the cant hook is really looking for it's a bit of a thing of a bite in the log, but it's what I prefer. Um, so you can move around cants in the mill. So if anyone asks the difference between a PB and a kill hook, you know. Um, right. And this is one of my favorite tools. I talked a little bit about it earlier. Um, this is the Wheeler saw, which has been for many decades the preferred pruning tool for orchardists. Uh, actually has a bone saw blade on it that can be used as a push cut or pull cut. Um, when you cut the trees, sometimes it's nicer to do a pull cut. You don't want to fall out of the tree. So sometimes you yeah, can switch this to do a pull cut. Uh, so it's a, it's like three, four, nine replaceable blade. It lasts forever. Um, you can also use it if you have to break down an animal and stuff like that. That's your thing. Um, and one bent piece of the item that's actually spring loaded in here with um, with just a nice handle. So you can use a mitten because it's winter time when you're doing the opening. So you can hold that with the mitten. Um, and it's just a classic, beautiful tool to make because it's going to last forever. Um, and uh, an easily replaceable blade, just a solid, simple thing. Um, as opposed to this, which I'm saying is an incredible uh, Japanese engineering, very aggressive blade. Uh, in comparison, this is like a lightsaber. But this just goes right through the wood. But um, yeah, this has. Um, an impulse hardened blade from teeth. So that eventually they use a laser to harden the teeth individually, um, which makes them last three to four times as long as a mountain impulse huh? tool. But you cannot really sharpen it again. So when this is done, you ideally recycle this metal, you get a new blade, um, and the handle can keep being used. But with a lot of these, a lot of saws, the blade is by far the most expensive part. Um, it's got a nice rubber grip. If you were to take good care of it, this wood could last a very, very long time. Um, Silky is just really nice, really nice. Whatever they make is good. So, like Japanese steel, they're just okay, my steel. And it's got this nice sheath in it. You have to have you can put a carabiner on it. The time it tears over. And the rope the snap or two, if the rope is still doing it, they can feel real into the leg for climbing and things like that. So it's not flopping around. Um, yeah, so that's a good little saw there. Mm -hmm. There. Um, this stuff here called the Blue Creeper. Um, I really like it because it's kind of like WD 40, but it also lubricates at the same time. So, like a little bit. It's got this really small sort of like needle like applicator. So you can really just put like a few drops in there and you really, uh, um, you don't need a lot to really be efficient with where you put it. This is probably not the most natural product, but you know, if you're using a tiny little bit of this to preserve all the embodied energy and fix the tool, I think it makes sense to me, um, you know. And then for like specifically, what would you use that for? What would you use to apply that to? Well, most recently, uh, we we do have a we fix some windows, and then there's those ancient uh, hinges. So I'm trying to save the hinges. So I've been going and before I kind of take the little uh, piece of metal out to redo the window, I've been trying to lube it up with this a little bit, so it'll come out with not be destroying it. Um, but some heirloom hinges, hinges like this. 
And then in, you know, just bolt on something and just just a little bit of this right there too. You're really like you need the lug nuts on your in your tires, stuff like that. It's all frozen out for us to know. Um and then yeah, this is a a nice uh, lubricant for your for your hinges on all of your all of your hand tools. Uh, that's an eco lube in my Baco. I think this one's actually worthwhile. Um they still build these things for cleaning resin off your tools. And I think that's a jam. And they quit using like ice and all the really take about all soaking and then use product. It's a really good bringing resin off your tools. Probably special techniques for that. But um sometimes the, the oils for your metal are nice because you can use, you know, enchanted oils, but sometimes they'll gum up. Um, and that's not as desirable, you know, something that's not going to come up and impede the flow of, of the tool. Um, Thanks for listening to me just spit all that out at you. What kind of resin are you talking about? Like, are you stuff like pine? Pine resin, if you're working with a lot of medicinal herbs like uh, calendula or cannabis or something like that, your resin is flooding pretty quickly. Um, we work with a lot of uh, Christmas tree growers, so they're always looking for ways to get their resin off of it. Tools or you know, cannabis growers, and that's uh, pretty quick. Um, so, yeah, like I said, robot alcohol, it's inexpensive and effective. Soap and then we'll scrub and then what? So, when you're selecting the tools, you know, choosing, you kind of weighing these things like the supply chain is made. And how expensive is such like every time, or is there certain values that feel like more important to you that you like really like focus on? Mm -hmm. I think it, yeah, if it was getting some kind of power tool, I would think more about like supply chain and in country of origin. Um, if I'm getting a hand tool, it's often how effective, how long do I think it will last? Um, and does it fit like a specific application that I have? Because um, I know I'm probably never going to need to buy another hardware again after buying this thing. Mm -hmm. um, not that I didn't really have to be bought it, but I'm not going to need it. So it's not. Um, are there any applications for which you haven't been able to find a worthwhile heirloom tool that you wish would be developed? Oops. Yeah, like what are you doing? And it breaks every time. You, why isn't there a better choice? I have to think about yeah, it. Well, it makes me think of just like all those tools you should that are really unique. I think that's probably where those came from, you know, where they were probably using some sort of tool and it's just like blast. You know, this thing doesn't work. And like over and over again, it's like the evolution of tool and application, right? So there's like a relationship, which is kind of inspiring me here is like we talk about supply chains and all that stuff. And then also this kind of like opens the door for like an heirloom cool culture where like people can participate in the process of making tools or like know their local tool makers There's a relationship there as opposed to like you know worldwide supply chain it's not that it's bad but when we're talking about heirloom tools and like specific applications um it just makes me think about like the fun, like the niche you know fine tool like you really only need this heirloom tool if you're doing this really. You'll start niche tool network. Learn each other. Now papers publications video. They needed the source of being made in the Japanese rice harvest. You can get a whole sheet of detail on them. So, like, you can't get one of them. So, you can do a lot of and talk to other people. Really? So, it's like an idea of like a you know, both modern and specialty tool that people really want here. But the sourcing is tough. So, like, you know, that speaks to your question too, Will, about like, well, maybe you had like the most rocking tool and it's like, you know, such a difference in the world, or what do you know? What do you know? This clobbers, what? Yeah. 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 Ye
like do you go to the personally import the blade from Germany or what can you get them reasonably easily here? That's like a big thing too, even if it's such an elegant small tool. Yeah, there's a, a little piece, you know, can't get it just right. It's not the hard to say. Um this book uh, is really beautiful, I think. I'm probably familiar with it. I'm trying to see more self sufficient life and how to live it, but there was a lot of about those specific tools in here. Um and just like a lot of beautiful things in general. Um that when they really kind of you know healing up ties to see uh, the making wine and you know raising and all that good stuff. Um and so from this one you know I'm gonna you know, so you really want to nerd out on tools. Um this is this I've got it all. Um I don't know if you guys have the attention for me to read you one page of it or maybe not. Do do I'm going to get the place to that just um, so this is the tool book from William Brandt Ludovic, and it was passed with his daughter William of course. In the Mohammed days, when I was a boy, one went to the right. When the Lee Brandt came to the in front of the court, and I was one of the Brandt Chancellor, I was a little bit of a thousand, so I had a world war II. The hot sun beat on the garden. But when you gave water into the sandy soil, plants practically jumped. One afternoon, the town was seen solid as we passed them. My dad and I were working in the wood. I was four years old. By the first time, it would be quick growth tomatoes to move on. I can still remember the angry odor of tomato stems on my hands. Taking the tomatoes from me, he handed them through the open window to my mother. Ever after, I have known this is how life should be lived. But that memory is no more vivid to me than the feel that tools that made our small harvest possible. My parents never gave in to power tools, even when we first moved to a larger ranch house with a lawn and trees, and finally to a wonderful old house nesting among conifers and swimming with gardens. The shovel, the hoe, the rake, the watering can, and all the flower shears all came with us from the deserts and remained with us always. They never grew. The wood of the long handled tools was smooth and gray well in use. And plastic we were off as two animals. We had blades of tools again and again and again until they were perceptibly smaller. Bigger gardens called the new tools. We got a real mower and hedge covers, and for an risky legs of hopes. In those days, I often wish for electric guitar, so I can move guitar, but in an interest I'm glad to be able to have done without them. Through hand tools, I became intimate, the sight, smell, and sound, and feel of the garden. The whir of the mower stopped when I stopped, as did the snick snick of the edge shears and the deep tock tock of the hedge shear, edging shears. The burner made virtually no noise, and if you use them correctly, you got to clean the pot to shield the living interior of the stem. The pipe might also release the sweet odor of birch from the pungent stems of willow. The hose put water on the tops of the pot of clean, and a little trickle came up below. Where had the rest gone? The shovel exposed worlds beneath the ground, while the rain combed them back into work. Well, this is awesome. Thank you. 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 